Yeah. Just get away from me. Welcome to Backlot 605, episode 16. I'm Casey. I'm Brian. And uh, we got a special guest with us today. We do. We got Charlie with us here. Charlie, how's it going? Good. How are you guys? I'm doing good. Good. So we bring Charlie on for a reason. Why? What is that reason? Because we want to talk wrestling. Talk the we're gonna talk the wrestling. We're gonna talk the wrestling. We're figuring. We're gonna bring in a resident like knows a lot fucking more than I do. So Charlie, what is it that you know about wrestling? I, well, what do you want to know about professional wrestling? I guess is you might want to well, pair that down up. just yeah. a smidge. Yeah. What is your connection to it for people who don't know who you are? Yeah. Hello, my name is Charlie Eccles, and I am the commentator for <clears throat> for Midwest All Pro here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I've been there. Their play-by-play guy and their hype man for the beginning and the ending of the show, kind of start the show off, end the show off. I've done some ring announcing for them. And then additionally, I'm also one of the lead commentators for Magnum Pro down in Omaha, Nebraska as well. And additionally, I've been doing some ring announcing uh, just around the the Midwest here. I've been able to, I've been fortunate enough to also go to a a promotion called Crushed in Minnesota, where I was their ring announcer. Uh, I got to give a a shout out to Alex Benson, who is a a resident, a, a local referee who is also a booker out there and he he was kind enough to let me come in and do some ring announcing for them and then additionally uh the guys down at impact pro in uh, the iowa area have brought me in as a ring announcer as well so kind of making some rounds right now little by little a little bit of name for yourself trying to i'm trying to that's uh, kind of the name of the game it's a little bit harder you know when when i'm not in the ring with like some of these other guys are you know these i, I don't I, i'm I'm definitely not breaking my body like a lot of these other guys are. You know, I I think of a guy like Rich Maxwell, uh, who is a local pro wrestler, and he is he he he's been making his way all the way around the country uh, doing this kind of thing, really making a name for himself. He actually ended up winning uh, the Dusty Rhodes Scholarship mm. down at, over All In Weekend in, or I'm sorry, right before All In Weekend. Uh, really trying to make a name for himself. And, you know, other guys like Duke Cornell, who's uh, down in Omaha as well, been doing this for a very long time. And a lot of these guys have been making their name around the Midwest, and I- I'm trying to make a name for myself as well. And this has been I- – I've I've never been an athlete. <laughs> and so I- I've always had kind of the gift of gab, though. So And I my dream, my one of my idols growing up was JR, so J- Jim Ross. So. so you figured, hey, I can't be in the ring. I'm, gonna, I'm still going to make my way. There. Yeah, so yeah, yep, and I had I had a couple of guys. I, I showed some interest in doing some commentary for Midwest All Pro, which is which was my first promotion. And <clears throat> Nick Dinsmore, Eugene, actually knew who I was at the time because he had been running for about a year, and I was a fan, so he got to know me a little bit. And then he asked me to come in and do one night as a commentator. Funny thing was that my first night I was actually the color commentator. So a guy like Jerry Lawler, mm-hmm. who you know kind of added this pizzazz and the the inappropriate comments yeah. during those <laughs> during those matches. I was actually asked to do the color the first time. And the second in the second show, the guy who was our lead commentator asked if he could do the color because he felt that he just had a, a natural cynicism to him, and asked if I would do like I was doing the third man. And we had a, a, another guy doing the lead commentary. So I kind of got put on the back wheel. Well, then the, the guy who was lead there didn't really, he, he didn't show up uh, for the next couple of shows. So I took over as the, the lead play-by-play guy. <clears throat> and then I would go to the training center here in Sioux Falls and commentate over matches as the guys would, would learn some things and got to know a few of the moves that I really didn't know the names for. I'd see all the time, but didn't know how to call them. And, uh, learned a lot from Nick in that aspect that it's not, he was really good about telling me that fans don't want, they really don't want us to read war and peace to them. Mm-hmm. They want, they want to hear C spot run. You know, they want to, they want to know why this is happening in the ring and you don't really need to go into a, a huge depth it, with this. So he's been a huge help for me during this. Uh, Eugene's been, he was my step in the right direction, and then additionally, he is really, really great. He's been making me uh, kind of hone in on my craft and make sure that uh, that I just I give the right description for a move, you know, why this is happening, you know, and really help the fans to follow along with the story that these guys are are telling. So it's been a, 
I get pretty passionate about it, and I really enjoy the the guys that have been busting their asses as well. That you know, I could put over a million of these guys, and I've uh, shared shared cars with a lot of them too. But this has been it's been a, a a dream come true to be able to do this and to make a little bit of a name for myself recently has been been pretty cool. But you know, there's a lot of glass ceilings yet to be broken. I think you'll get there. Uh, let's hope so. <laughs> Just from him talking there, I can see you can see the passion coming out. I was going to say, is you think we brought the right guy yes. on today? Okay. <laughs> exactly. And so the reason we're bringing Charlie on is because fighting with my family is going to be nationwide released this weekend, and we want to talk about what wrestlers need movies. Yes. So we'll get to that once we get to our main topic, but we're going to jump right now, as we always do every week, to the box office. So I'm Brian, very I'm very proud of this box Brian office. Brian was right in our predictions. I last fucking week. called it. Yeah. So what came in at that number one spot? Number one came in at Adelita with number two at a, a Lego movie. And what did I say last week? Uh, that. You, yeah. Adelita Battle Angel number one. Yep. Lego movie number two. Yes. So Adelita Battle Angel pulled in what, $27 million this week? 27.8 it looks like. And Lego looks like brought in 21.2. So, uh... For these movies, you got to watch Alita this weekend. Yes. What was what was your theater like? Was it full? Was it? Um, I'd say about three quarters. The typical like it was in the XD theater. I saw it in XD 3D and whatnot. So those, unless it's an absolute powerhouse movie, it's never going to get full. You know, like the first three, what four rows, whatever that shit is, it wasn't full and whatnot. I'd say about eighty percent of the theater was full. So. Yeah. I mean, for the XD, where the people are going to drop 15, 16 bucks for a ticket, it was pretty good, actually. So this movie is pulling in uh, a lot under expectations right now. Not doing too hot. I don't think it's a matter of the... Is there some clunkiness to the movie? Yes. Um, but it's also the type of movie that... It's, got a, it's harder to find an audience for that type of movie here in the States as opposed to internationally. And I think everybody's just seeing is, oh, it's a box office flop because of the $170 million budget. I mean, that's a, a little bit of a hurdle to get through. And I'm just hoping that maybe at least International will help pick up the slack. And that's where this movie's going to make its money. It has to. It has to open up in China and Japan next weekend. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be the make or break for this movie. Big one's going to be China. Yep. Uh, number three, Isn't It Romantic? Uh, kind of sneaking in there, pulling $14 million. Rebel could not break it. No. I, yeah. I mean, for a comedy, with it doesn't have what budget is, but I'm sure it's no, but not I mean, any more than $20 million. No, and with a movie where you're literally putting um, the whole romantic comedy on its ear, like the, all the stereotypes of what the movie is is what they're playing into in this movie. And it's getting good reviews, which is surprising. Why? Because you don't think Rebel Wilson can make a decent movie? <laughs> well, she can make a decent movie. She's been in those okay, let me, perfect movies. Let me rephrase. <laughs> yeah, see, there you go. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. She's been in other movies that wasn't pitch perfect. Who's seen those movies? Yeah, I have no idea. Exactly. <laughs> uh, number four, What Men Want, sticking in that top five, ten million dollars, and then Happy Death Day to You. Very much. Let's let's talk about series. Happy Death Day to you. Your call for I first. I thought that one was going to do better. Actually, he, how, that was such a cult classic last he year. He gave me that. shit last week about Happy Death Day was going to take first over Adelita. Really? I, and you know what? I would have agreed with you actually. And I, uh, I mean, Alita, I thought that movie looked phenomenal. Uh, uh, but. I, the horror crowd, they're just such a hardcore crowd. And they will they will show up in in vanfuls for people to show up with that. So I'm really surprised that Happy Death Day to You didn't didn't crack the top three actually. Yeah, my prediction last weekend was that Happy Death Day was gonna be at number one with, with four, like thirty forty min- no, I said forty. You said forty? Yeah, because the first one pulled in thirty, so I was going for that sequel, gonna pull in four at least forty. It has more of the comedy aspect. Um, yeah, it's, it, didn't, it just didn't happen. And you got an opportunity to see it. And what was your thoughts? I did. Uh, briefly, I was disappointed by it. Very much. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's What's why, that? it, you know, you had the first run of people like that Thursday, Friday going out and checking and going, dude, do not go see this movie. It's, it, it's sitting at like a 50 something on Rotten Tomatoes right now. So it's not getting terrible reviews. And that first movie, you know, it had pretty much the same reviews, um, for people who liked the first movie, 
and liked like the comedy stuff to it, they're gonna love the second one. Mm-hmm. For me, I like the the horror type of stuff, so it's like that's back burner in this movie. You're it's you're straight up you are a tough sell on stuff. horror though. No, I like my simple horror. I like my stupid slasher movies. Leprechaun. Leprechaun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You and your fucking leprechaun. Fucking leprechaun, man. The only thing, the only, the only thing I give credit for the leprechaun is Warwick Davis. Up until well, like the last what two? Um. He wasn't in Origins, and he yeah, wa- because one of them was uh, um, Hornswoggle. Hornswoggle. Yep. And, and then the uh, the, the most recent one was not. No. That was a WWE release too, wasn't yes. it? Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Well, that's because <laughs> barely, the... just vaguely remember that 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 happened. So, actually, <laughs> funny story. I, I before I ever started with wrestling, I started dating my now fiance, and we went out to a football game with some of her college friends. And one of her friends who I'd never met walked up and he was like, oh, Charlie, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. What are your hobbies? And I, I just flat out said, I was like, oh, I'm really into professional wrestling. And he goes, and the first thing he says to me, and he goes, do you know who Hornswoggle is? And I was like, of all the professional wrestlers that you could mention to me, you're going to mention Hornswoggle to me? And I was like, yeah, I know who Hornswoggle is. Turns out he went to high school with him and was in <laughs> choir with him. And, he goes, and this is when he was still working for WWE, too, before anybody, you know, his now his real name is pretty well known. But he yeah. was, oh, yeah, his name's Dylan. He's a really nice guy. I love his sister. And like, <laughs> it was one of the funniest things I had ever ever heard in my life. It's, it's, yeah, how do, you, how do you start that conversation? Hey, do you know Hornswoggle? I know. Like of all the wrestlers. <laughs> you guys probably, I don't know how into wrestling you are, but it's just, yeah, Vince McMahon's son? Yeah, I know that guy. So. Yeah. Vince's you, illegitimate son. There you go. <laughs> do you know this guy named Dwayne Johnson? No, I've never heard of him. No, but this Hornswoggle guy. <laughs> you mean Rocky Johnson's son? Yeah. He was okay. <laughs> <laughs> he never did anything after that. Yeah, no. <laughs> he never made a splash yeah. doing anything. Yeah, that's like pretty much, you just you look at the WWE now, or just even the last like 10, 15 years, it's like if they're Samoan, they're all related to that line of... Human beings, for the most part, except for Samoa Joe, he is yeah, except yeah, for like the war. Yeah. the guy that has Samoa in his yeah, name. Samoa is in his name, and he does not have that the uh, Anawahi uh, bloodline with him. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the box office. You can check out Brian's review for Alita Battle Angel coming soon on our website. Yep, once and, I get that written. Yep, and then my review for Happy Death Day too. So we'll both go a little bit more in depth as to our full thoughts on that. It will be fun. Sure. <laughs> Let's jump to the news. We got some big news this week. We do? Is yeah. it big or is it mediocre? Is it uh, in between? It is was it really high? big and then now it got to mediocre because the Oscars. Because the Oscars can't get their fucking shit together. Exactly. God, the fucking Academy this year. The Academy Awards were going to cut four category- categories from their live telecast and air it during the commercials. Fucking stupid. That was going to be cinematography, editing, live action short films, and makeup and hairstyling. Only to two days later, retract retract and say they're going to air every category. Maybe maybe the Academy is just trying to learn what retcon means. And just kind of like reboot like every other third day or something. I don't know. I don't know. They're just throwing shit at the wall at this point. Well, I mean, when when you've got big names like Brad Pitt and Guillermo del Toro and all these actors, directors, and everybody that aren't even directly involved with the cinematographer editing, those were the big two... Huge ones are getting so much backlash. And, you know, it's the Academy going, Oh, shit, I think we fucked up. And they did fuck up. Yeah. They were going to have, I mean, with all intents and purposes, Alfonso Cuaron is probably going to win Best Cinematography. And he's kind of a big name at this year's Oscars. Mm Mm-hmm. No doubt uh, if he would win, like, Best Picture or Best Director as well, would have shit all over that in his speech. Oh, yeah. And you got to bet they don't want that anywhere on their telecast. Oh, no. There will be, I guarantee it will be some sort of delay. <laughs> yeah. Just because they want to make sure that they mute some somebody's, and it's not even going to be for swearing this time. Yeah. But they have gone back, and they're going to air every single category. But I, I, I think there's still some ill will there. You think? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to watch it this year. Even though they are going to air all this stuff, it's like, this is just the biggest shit show with... The Kevin Hart situation to no host to we're cutting out categories to no actually we're going to bring them back. Yeah. To that stupid what's the most popular film that they brought up a few months ago. 
Yeah, let's not even bring that up. Yeah. That was the one where they were saying that they were going to bring in, like, pop culture, more more of the pop culture for yeah, films. Yeah. The, yeah. You would actually have the that, ability yeah. of Fast and Furious to win, a fr- and to win an Oscar. Okay. <laughs> well, they already should win an Oscar. Huh? So they already should win an Oscar. I, fuck yeah. <laughs> this guy last week was giving me shit because we were doing Sophie's Choice. Okay. And he pitted for me the, the pleasure of putting up the Pixar, uh, basically, collective versus the Fast and Furious franchise. And, like, I don't care what you guys think. You're going to hate me for this, but bye-bye Pixar because I'm not living without my Fast and Furious. <laughs> <laughs> like, nope. So we- I picks, need me some Dominic Toretto. Picks Vin Diesel and The Rock over Buzz and Woody. Hey, you know what? Without Buzz and Woody, I still have plenty of Tom Hanks. I got Galaxy Quest. I got all sorts of good stuff from Tom Hanks. That's true. There's probably not a lot of good event with Vin Diesel besides these Fast and Furious movies. Now you're catching on. Besides, besides the pacifier. Oh, my God. <laughs> all of a sudden, I had flashbacks into the Tooth Fairy. Oof, another rock movie. <laughs> well, he didn't. Know, he hasn't made the slam dunks every single time. No. There was a long string of really bad movies for The Rock, and then suddenly the, he had a, a good start, and then he dipped down, and then he rose back up in these last about four years. Well, here, I, this here's what I'll give you real quick here, just because this is actually the movie that made me better appreciate him. And realized that he actually had the potential. Because before, you know, you think just like the Scorpion King. You're just right, like, right. they just used him for the muscle, right? right? The movie Be Cool. Oh, yeah, 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 Where he yeah, plays yeah. The, the bodyguard where you obviously know he's gay. Yes, yep, yep. And the part where he's singing It's Only Raining Men. The blue, bright powder blue uh, cowboy pant things he's got going on. Yes. After I saw that, I was like... This man, I was like, I, he, 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 for me, he completely shed anything WWE. I was like, that is an actor. I'm all, I'm 100% behind that I guy. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I will 100% agree on that. He was, well, and that was something that uh, I think a lot of WWE fans really shit on The Rock for going to Hollywood and trying to make it as an actor. But I think there was also that side of all of us that, like, when he gets a chance to really show his charisma like mm-hmm. he did and be cool that's when he might take off because he really i mean there's no marquee to it i mean he is the most charismatic person to ever be in professional wrestling yes and there's really bar none to anybody else and i'm, I'm really i'm very happy to see him uh, as a mainstream star now i i want to find out is there a single wwe past, present, or possibly future that could possibly do the bring it on dialogue that he did in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and you will, you probably, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I don't think there's anybody that could possibly do both sides of a conversation from fucking bring it on. <laughs> there's no one like the rock. Though. There is no one like there the rock. Like okay. Yeah. I apologize. I did not Hogan doing that. I mean, Come on, brother! He might <laughs> Bring it on, brother! Remember, we'll find out about it ten years later. But all right. So, what were we talking about, Brian? Well, we were talking about the Oscars, and oh, then I diverted like I always fucking do. Um, any other final thoughts on the Oscars? Said they're stupid. I'm hoping that maybe they'll finally get their shit together and they'll they'll learn from this wonderfulness that is the chaotic year that they've had, and that next year that maybe everything will just go smoothly. Maybe. That's my thought. So, we got a couple trailers we're going to talk about now. Some good and some... Eh, that's my thought anyway. Oh, well, which one's the good one for you? Ma. Ma? Ma's the good one. We'll jump into that. So, Ma is a uh, horror thriller that's going to star Octavia Spencer. And just because I don't recognize anybody and I don't remember his name, whatever, but the kid from Girl Meets World. But no, in terms of the, the trailer for Ma, um, very Kathy Bates-ish kind of where... Playing the little Miss Innocent, you know, nice, you know, neighbor next door kind of thing, and just it's creepy as fuck. It is, and I'm totally all for like, you know, you look at Octavia Spencer and you're just like, you know, you know, I think movies like The Help and stuff like that, where it's like, you know, I'm expecting a Academy Award winning, you know, stuff like that, and all of a sudden you're just like, that bitch scares me now. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the Academy Award winning actress because, shit, I want her to win a fucking Academy Award for this. 
Well, how about bring you wait? Le- legitimate let's bring the movie out first. Movie. Let's see how it does. Yeah. And then we'll talk next year. But if you talk about the, the Kathy Bates and Misery type of you know, correlation between the two, Kathy Bates won for Best Actress that year. I'll be damned. Yeah. And horror doesn't get enough uh, recognition at the Oscars. So, well, hey, you know, this could be it right here. between that and the whole Jordan Peele thing, who knows? Maybe next year will be a, a, a different tune again. I hope so. So uh, let's jump to, I guess, the bad trailer that you thought. I, well, I wouldn't call it bad. I just, I don't get it. Like, I don't know. The It's the trailer for Frozen 2. You know. It's because you are a. I'm a dude. 40, <laughs> I'm a 40 year old man. <laughs> this trailer was not for you, Brian. No, it wasn't. But I have seen it. I have four year olds that, had, you know, especially between like the age of like two and three, that's fucking all they watch is fucking Frozen over and over again and yeah. over again. So. You know, I don't see what, what, this trailer doesn't give you anything that really made you understand what the story is about. Like, there's nothing there. Like, to me, I legit think the rumor is true that the only reason why this was dropped was because Disney's like, Aladdin, shit, fuck, we, oh, shit, um, give them Frozen. (laughs) Get them to stop talking about Will Smith's genie. Let's just throw out this trailer really quick. Oh my god, he looks so fat and bloated in that trailer. <laughs> <laughs> He's just fat and bloated. Maybe he is just fat and bloated at this point. No, I well, as long as he still has the physique of what he, you know, or at least the like the stature he had when he did the whole like fucking you know, bungee jumping from the helicopter over the Grand Canyon this last summer, I'm pretty sure he's not that. <laughs> I mean, he is on set for Bad Boys 3, and I doubt they're going to have a fat Will Smith on set for that. That's true, and they have shown pictures of him there, there yeah. too. So That's just bad CGI. It, oh, it's... But this, this Frozen 2 trailer, yeah, like I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Yeah. I don't get what's going on. I don't get it. Like, no. They, there's no dialogue in it. It's all epic music. Um, basically, the only thing it really shows is like how powerful Elsa is, and you got that from the first movie. That Elsa is trying to ride the waves of some great big huge ocean. Maybe this is just Point Break, except <laughs> Frozen. <laughs> we couldn't name it Point Break Frozen, so we just called it Frozen Two. Animated Keanu Reeves is gonna show up. Shut up! I'm still waiting for that in Toy Story. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the little John Wick doll to show up in Toy Story Four. No, his character from Point Break is gonna show up in that one. I don't. And then he's gonna cross over into Frozen too. So, Charlie, you saw the Frozen trailer. I did. I did, did you? Did you understand what was going on? No, not not one bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was a fan of the first one, though. I will say that I I actually really enjoyed it. But you know, for me, with that with that movie, there's really not a whole lot that I remember about it outside of the music because you couldn't turn to a radio station without hearing the music yep. at that point in time. Between and, that and Moana. Yeah, between, yeah, and, you know, and D- Disney does that. They, yeah. they put out really great soundtracks for kids, and uh, they have since I was a kid. I remember having the Lion King tapes and mm-hmm. and Hercules and all those tapes when I was a kid, yeah. <laughs> but if they can't top the music that they did in the, in the first one, it's just, it's not going to be near as successful. Additionally, like, the story was okay in the first one but it was just there were things that i still don't understand about it that i think were mainly for children and and i don't think even the kids are gonna understand it yeah exactly if if me as an adult as a 40 year old adult can't understand the trailer to frozen the kids are gonna just be like elsa that's all they're going to get. All that that's all they need though. to see. The, all yeah. the, just going to be like, there's Elsa, there's Anna, there's Olaf, there's I'm, Kristoff. I'm pretty sure that's why Ralph Breaks the Internet did so well anyway, is because they showed all of the all of the Disney princesses in the trailer anyway. So Something missing from this trailer. What's that? Music. I wouldn't be surprised. It, a weird, well, it felt like a super serious action movie, like... With the, with well, the score here's, that they... Went. This is the way I, my brain is spinning, and you actually alluded to it, and that is that... You know, if they can't, they're going to have a problem if they can't top the original soundtrack. Oh, yeah. And what I picture is they spin it kind of like Toy Story, where is the one song is kind of the theme for that entire franchise. Okay. They never really changed up the song. Okay. So my, I don't wonder if they're going to just keep let it go as... As the the franchise's you know go to number. That wouldn't surprise anyone. No. Yeah. Oh, I hope not. 
I can't deal with that anymore. They don't want to let it go. Yeah, I'm ready for that. <laughs> I'm ready for them to let it go. Frozen 2 needs a little bit more Randy Newman, is what I think, <laughs> yes. actually. Yeah. So we got uh, news. News? The Breaking Bad movie. It's going to well, be dropping on Netflix and AMC. The way I read it was that it's going to be on AMC first. And then in the style of, like, where does a movie go after, you know, like, say, like the Disney stuff. is It would, would go straight to Netflix before it did uh, HBO, Showtime, all that stuff, right? And my understanding is it's going, to, it's going to air on AMC. And then once it's done on AMC, that's when it's going to go to Netflix. Like, Netflix is going to get first dibs. And I, my assumption is the reason why they're doing this is because if it wasn't for Netflix, I don't think they would have even gotten as far as season five because Netflix is really where people started binging. Like Breaking Bad is like the, the show that started the concept of binge watching television. Exactly. And because I think it's season three is when season one first started showing up on Netflix and that's where I that's where I got my Breaking Bad originally was from Netflix, so I think they I think they're owning up to the fact that if it wasn't for Netflix, they wouldn't have this now. So they're probably saying, "Hey, you know what? You played nice. You helped us. We're bringing it to you." So they knew where their audience was. Exactly. Yeah. And AMC typically has a really good relationship, seemingly to me, to Netflix because of. You know, Walking Dead, Better Call Saul. As soon as that next season is to drop out, the first one is up there ready for everybody to start benching all the way back through again. Yep. Well, we all know somebody who, I mean, everybody's guilty of it, you know, especially The Walking Dead. Like, oh, I'll wait until it's on Netflix. Yep. Like, they're just waiting for it at that point, so. I'm stupid looking forward to this. I was a huge fan of Breaking Bad. Uh, like I said, I didn't get into Breaking Bad until they were, like like I said, into their third season, and that's because I'm like, oh, it's on Netflix. Let's try this out. Why the fuck did I not know what this was sooner? And I'm I'm glad that they're really spinning it um towards the Jesse Pinkman character and definitely kind of seeing what's what's going on, what's happened next. The theory rumor still is that Walter White will reprise his role in some shape or form, and that he, Brian Cranston will be in the movie at least probably one of them because you know if they have success with this they'll keep doing it. Oh yeah. So you you guys are fans of this. I've never watched Breaking Bad. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Tell him he's wrong. Oh, it's fantastic. Oh, I already, <laughs> yeah. Literally every yeah, yeah. person I talk to, they're like, "Yeah, you're wrong. You need to watch Breaking Bad." Yeah. What are you even doing with your life? You've you've got Netflix, right? No, what's that Netflix? <laughs> what's yes, that Netflix? I have, <laughs> yes, I have Netflix. Your homework before next week <laughs> is to watch all of Breaking Bad. You probably could. Once you start, it's really hard. To it's stop. really hard yeah. to stop. You'll you will sit there and be you'll be like five episodes in, going, but I have to sleep. <laughs> I think that's where I felt the problem. I was gonna start once, and I'm like, shit. If I start this, I'm gonna sit and watch everything. And they're like an hour. How many times long. have you watched The Office? Shut up. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Star Wars Episode Nine as a rap production. With a great little picture of them all hugging Daisy Ridley and John Boyega and Oscar Isaac all hugging, and Oscar Isaac looks picture. like he's gonna cry his little face off. Oh. I didn't see that picture. That's awesome. Yeah, oh, I have to find it. Continue. He, Keep he going. does. He does look like he's about to cry, and it's kind of the sweetest thing ever. <laughs> so, uh, episode nine is is gonna be the next Star Wars film, obviously coming out this December. And uh, after what happened in the Last Jedi. Not sure how fans are going to react to this. I know a lot of people are already pissed that they're even making another one. <laughs> but, okay, I, I'm going to step in on this one here. They're going to show up. Star Wars fans don't not show up. We showed up for the goddamn Clone Wars and made that a box office hit. You are not wrong. So, if so, Jar Jar Binks can be in a movie and people will still show up, right? Exactly. Star, they're still going to show up. And you know, the thing is, oh, that is that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Just showing him the picture of Oscar Isaac like he's crying. Oh, I mean, I am a huge Star Wars fan. I remember my first exposure to it was the re-releases in the '90s, and I was over the moon the first time that I saw this. That was the first time I got to see him in the theater, too, really? was yeah. the re-releases. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, that's how a lot of us have, and you know, they'll never do that again, because we have so many of them now. 
Uh, so it was a cool a cool thing to see a movie that was 20 years old get I mean it reached number one again if I remember mm-hmm. right yeah it was it's such a huge huge deal that they were going to be doing these prequels and the prequels sucked <laughs> like what was your introduction in Star Wars again was it the prequels yep oh no my first introduction to Star Wars was walking into a pizza hut and there was a, a cardboard cutout of Darth Maul and I'm like, what is that? I'm probably five, you know, five years old at that point. Right. And my parents are like, okay, yeah, that's Star Wars. Like, you need to watch it. So we, Darth Maul was my first introduction. I watched the original trilogy before I ever watched Phantom Menace. Okay, Lewis. okay, good. So good. I watched the original trilogy first. See, and if they didn't have Jar Jar Binks, you know, and the fact that the, the prequels felt like I was getting an, a lesson in economics the entire time, uh, the... You know, Darth Maul was an awesome character. There were some good that came out of the prequels. I mean, Darth Maul, especially now that they're, you know, spoiler alert, looks like they're going to be making the entire universe canon with mm-hmm. Clone Wars and everything yep. like that, which is awesome. Uh, you know, the whole Darth Maul story, he's an awesome character with a lot of depth to him now. I think that's going to be awesome. And, you know, if going back to the backlash of, of uh, Last Jedi, it, was, it wasn't... The Clone Wars, this movie sucked. <laughs> there, it was just a mixed bag of reviews. Oh yeah. So and for some me, some people loved it, some people hated it, and your your val- your opinions valid either way. You know, and the things that I had pe- that I heard people say was that because Ryan Johnson really kind of put a lot of things on their ear, and that was actually one of the things that I I loved about it mm-hmm. was you know like people were complaining about like one of the things I remember specifically is when. When Kylo Ren is going after Luke Skywalker, and, and he just kind of does the whole dust off his shoulder thing, I'm over there giddy and laughing my ass off. I'm like, that is what like old school Luke Skywalker, who's just tired of everyone's shit, should be doing. <laughs> He's just basically going, "Fuck you, I'm done. Watch this shit." And I appreciated that. Oh yeah. For me, that was worse than Jar Jar stepping in poop. <laughs> I hated that moment. Like, like you said, it is a mixed bag of movies because the next thing he does is one of my favorite things in all of Star Wars is when he disappears at the end of Luke's hour mm-hmm. and says, see you around, kid. I'm like, that's, just, that's the middle finger right there because yeah. Han would say that all the time to Luke. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's the middle finger, not some cheesy wiping off your shoulder. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. but it, it's, it's exactly like what Charlie just said, though, is that you and I looked at the same scene and a different perspective on it, and they're both valid responses. Yep. See, I think that's what makes Star Wars so great. Mm-hmm. Is even the prequels? There's yes, they are shitty. I will be the prequel apologist though. <laughs> well, I still love those movies, but yes, they're also a mixed bag in a different different way than Last Jedi is for sure. <laughs> well, and when the Force Awakens came out, uh, one of my friends who is a fairly big Star Wars fan sends me a text message, and I'm driving. He goes, hey, I kind of want to talk about Star Wars for a second. I finally just saw it. Can can we talk for a minute? I'm like, oh yeah, call me. I'm driving. We'll we'll hash this out. I hated it. I hate. It. And he goes off and he goes and and I was like, why did you hate it? Why did you hate this movie? Like it, it was all all the Force Awakens was was the ex, was the first movie. <laughs> like, it was a new hope over again. Like and it was done very well. I thought it was fantastic and, he, and his two big arguments were A, he's a fan of the prequels and everybody needs to stop shitting on them. <laughs> and B, the uh, the Wookiee crossbow does not shoot red lasers. <laughs> I was like, well, how fucking pithy can all of you guys be? <laughs> Come on, man. You know, and I loved Last Jedi. I, you know, I thought there was a lot of deconstruction done that I, I felt necessary to continue mm-hmm. it on, uh, even past Episode Nine. Uh, you know, it, it feels like there's going to be a lot more to the story, and I'm really happy to see that. Uh, but I also have friends who, you know, they watched the casino scene and said they almost walked out of the theater because they hated it that much. And I, I, that's a valid reason. Like, that wasn't my favorite scene either, but I still thought it was a great well, a, that's a just, great addition. Yeah, I mean, there's things about that scene that were good, but was it necessary? Probably not. Probably not. You know, it's almost one of those things like, he's like, we need to get Justin Thoreau in this movie. He's a huge nerd. He wants to be in this, but we don't know how. We got this whole concept. We're just going to throw it in there. Do we need Justin Thoreau in it, though? Shut up. Justin Thoreau is a good actor. He didn't do anything in the movie, though. 
so. Yeah. I, I was one of those people. I hated that scene. The Canto Bite scene is terrible. Yeah, there's a lot. There's but so there's many things about it that were completely unnecessary. Legit, probably one of my favorite Star Wars moments, besides the the Luke saying "see a round kid," is is the throne room fight mm-hmm. in the Last Jedi. But that was also... probably one of the best scenes ever done in the entire Star Franchise. Wars story. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that was one of the like the colors and everything in that. I was just mesmerized with that whole scene. And then it has some of the worst, like the Canto Bite stuff. So I think it's. A perfect mix bag. Yeah, yes. you know, Does that in, make any sense? In the the overall Star Wars story, though, they had to somehow get to the get to the planet of Cantabite to introduce the children that were there. Right, and that was the only reason they had they had them there. And I'm sure there will be J.J. Abrams will be coming around saying, "All right, I'll clean this up." So. Well, and you know, but some of the, some some of the things that it seemed like to me for Ryan Johnson's though was that. Because J.J. was still there, still talking in his ear. He's still on there as producer. He's just busy doing, what, Mission Possible, whatever the fuck he was doing. Um, Probably to, not a bad robot producing but, stuff. Yeah, but, yeah, right? But, three. Oh, <laughs> paradox. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's probably, you know, th- you know when, when he did his first one here, there's a lot of it where the Lucasfilms, the Marvel, Dis- or not, the, just the Disney side of things are, this is how we're going to need to do things. Mm-hmm. You know, and I picture JJ going to Brian going, okay, I didn't want to do this. Here's how you need to fuck this shit up. <laughs> see, I see a different way. I see JJ working with Kathleen Kennedy and they're making their time kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And Ryan Johnson comes in and he's like, yeah, fuck La- uh, Force Awakens. I'm doing my own thing. And literally Luke Skywalker throwing the lightsaber. Out. I love that part. Oh, I love that too. I, it was such a good turn. Like, <laughs> and it, it toyed with, uh, with, the emotions of the like Star Wars fans, like the hardcore ones, were like, "Oh, Luke's finally got his lightsaber back! Fuck, are you kidding me?" And he's just like, Meh. and he just throws yeah. it out. I think that and was that, a symbol for Ryan Johnson saying, "Everything beforehand, throw it out. This is the story." And obviously, he didn't do a bad job. They literally took him off of the, you know, Episode Nine, so he can go start working on his own fucking trilogy. Yeah. So uh, quickly to jump onto that, they're working on two other trilogies after Episode Nine, right? It's Ryan not... Johnson's and then uh, the Game of Thrones guys are doing their own trilogy. Yeah. Too. So it's not like they're, you know, it's not like they hated what he was doing, you know. No. They're like, we really like what you're doing here. You get your own movies. Mm-hmm. Oh, how all the Star Wars fans are going to love that. <laughs> hey, you know what? I enjoyed, I enjoyed his movie. So, you know, yes, there's parts of it that were completely unnecessary, but I'll take it. That's Star Wars. I thought he had a good feel for the in Last Jedi, though. Yeah. I think he would have been a great choice to to do the solo movie as mm-hmm. well, uh, especially with that that twist ending with Darth Maul coming in and everything like. That. I think if they were to be doing a trilogy with that with the solo movie, which is, I think was the original plan, wasn't it? Was, it was. A, yeah, and now it's not going to happen. But the original plan was to have a solo trilogy, which. I think could still happen, and a lot of the theories that I've read on that is that Darth Maul and Jar- and Jabba are going to be fighting for for Han's life, uh, which I think would be one of the most fantastic experiences from a cinema point of view for myself. And if it weren't for Ryan Johnson, I wouldn't have Kevin Smith as a stormtrooper. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so jumping to the next news. Uh, Nothing related to anything you were just brought up. No, nothing at all. And for Bat- me, it's kind of meh news. Oh, meh news. Meh. meh. Batman is going to fight the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in animated form. So Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a comic series from a few years ago. And uh, w- why don't you want to watch this, Brian? It's uh, Batman and Ninja Turtles. I don't know. Maybe because I've watched zero animated DC movies. you and- watched zero? I need a, movies. How I, many of the at live action DC movies have you watched? All of them. And literally probably almost every animated one is better than animated. Oh, I'm not. No, yeah. there's zero argument there. I've been flat out told that. Um, no, in fact, actually what I... Okay, I take that back. Not all of them. I'm The original Doomsday was pretty horrible from what I've been told, and that's why they redid the Death and Life of Superman. Yeah. Um, which actually are ones that I really want to watch right now. Because I'm a huge fan of that storyline, so maybe that will be my introduction, and I will just have to go back and watch some of the other ones. Most of those are available on the DC app right now. 
if you if you wanted your two week free trial. <laughs> so, <laughs> Will I be able to get them watched in the two weeks? God damn it! But Batman versus Ninja Turtles. <laughs> so Brian has never seen any of the animated movies. Nope. Uh, I've seen I, bits and pieces. I've seen probably half of them that they've released. I'm actually a big fan of the DC animated uh, universe, and I've seen just about every one of them. Um, a few of the super I didn't see Superman Unbound or uh, Superman All Stars. Um, there were was it Unbound? I can't remember. Uh, but yeah, I, every single one of those movies, just about it. The Teen Titans versus the Justice League one fell a little short for me, but. They were all really, really good movies. So, do you I'm, want to see Batman go against the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I do want to see this? I, I have complete. They could do just about anything at this point with how good those movies have been, and I would have complete faith that it's going to be a good movie. I just hope that they steer more towards because again, I don't know the source material um, for for the, the, the comics. Okay. Um, to the fact that if they're more geared towards. The Nickelodeon side, or if they're more geared towards the original TMNT, like the old black and white, like you know, Sin City style. It's a, it's more towards that older style. Because it's not t- as much of the Nickelodeon. Because the, that's where it's like I want to see some serious like mayhem going on. And these Batman movies that are in the animated stuff, they're the darker Batman. Right, but at the same time too, you know, they're you know, they're not DC's not stupid into the point in terms of their animated movies in regards to making. Uh, animated versions of some of these stories that they don't think would translate well or and or sell well. And, you know, I guarantee they're banking on the fact that there's the nostalgia for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I my fear is that they're going to soften it up from the source material because of it being animated turtles. Well, they've done rated R. Well, no, I know they've done rated R, but there's no such... The closest that you've gotten to anything that, like, harsh for the Turtles was the very first TMNT, and that's because Raphael yells damn, like, six times. And that's about as close to the, like, edginess that Raphael ever gets. Right, right. And, you know, you get into some of the more hardcore comic book fans, though, and they'll tell you, like... They'll tell you straight up that the Ninja Turtles is just a straight up rip off of Daredevil. Yeah. So that's what, so if we're if we're getting into that that close to the source material, I think this animated movie is probably going to be the closest thing to that. The only reason I could see your concern is that Nickelodeon is in partners with this. Are they? And, yeah. Oh, okay. And maybe they don't want their Ninja Turtles being that hardcore that's gritty my, Ninja Turtles. That, that's my fear. Yeah. Maybe because, they'll let it go, like just for this one thing, because it's it's not streaming on Nickelodeon or anything. Well, hopefully, like it's not that, like a so. Batman Brave and the Bold pairs up with the Ninja Turtles type oh, of God. thing. Like, which more power to them. They need a, they need to view it from a few different audiences. But you know, I think some of the more hardcore comic book fans who did read that series, I think they do deserve to see that that darker series. So, so yeah, I'm hoping it's that dark stuff. Well, here's hoping because if it, if Nickelodeon is involved. It's gonna be probably it's gonna be a little touchy. I mean, that's why I think Nacho Libre failed so badly is because it was Nickelodeon <laughs> instead of MTV Films. Like if yeah, I that's con- why Nacho Libre failed so badly. <laughs> I saw that movie in the theater and I was like, I'm so disappointed by this. It's Jack Black. It could have been so much better. <laughs> well, that's gonna be a good segue because that is a wrestling movie. And know what we're gonna oh, talk about? That. Wrestlers and movies. <laughs> I did it subconsciously this time. We need Jack Black and more wrestling movies. That's what we need. <laughs> I want Jack Black to come back as Nacho Libre. No, we're not going to talk about any more about Nacho Libre. Instead, we're going to be talking Fighting With My Family is coming out. And so that's going to star um, or be the story of WWE superstar Paige. Mm-hmm. So this is her story produced by Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. And so we're going to ask Charlie, what are some other wrestlers that need movies? Uh, there are a lot of wrestlers that need <laughs> that should have movies. The first one, when you guys asked me this and were texting me about this, first one that I think needs a movie is Ric Flair. Uh, if you if anybody watched his Thirty for Thirty on mm-hmm. ESPN, like, or knew anything about him, if you read his book, like, <laughs> Ric Flair should have his own movie, and I it needs to. I don't know who could pull off Ric Flair, but it's one of those like. Uh, <laughs> like Bohemian Rhapsody style style movies that you'd see, like just this sad. I think his 
life put into the movie perspective could potentially be one of those like Oscar winning movies. I, and I mean that in, with all sincerity, if you know any part of his story, like he has had the most insane life. I think he would, he has to be number one as, as far as a wrestler who needs a movie. I don't know how, how you guys would feel or if you guys know anything about that, about that 30 for 30 or heard anything about him. So well, when you made your list, I had made a separate list on mine. Okay. Ric Flair was like top two or three for me okay. as well. Okay. Okay. And I'm as you're talking, I'm like, God, who who the hell would play Ric Flair? Right. And the thing I'm thinking of because you brought up like the Bohemian Rhapsody and kind of the 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 playboy kind of lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. What if you have like Martin Scorsese, Leonardo DiCaprio? That wouldn't be bad. Teaming up. And I would playing Ric Flair. I you know the first thing I think of just because of how well the movie was done is if you gave the any one of these for that matter, just for the sake of just for the sake of argument. Um, but when Darren Aronofsky did the wrestler is, I think he had a very good vision of that. And if you gave him like the right biopic source material, I think he could, I think he'd be one that'd be very well to be able to pull that off Mm -hmm. because I mean, the wrestler seemed very, very to that sense that it almost seemed more of a biopic than it was more of a piece of fiction. Oh yeah. I can agree with that. I mean, in all actuality, and this is not to, like, make anybody freak out about one of my professions by any means, but, I mean, that is so, that story, I mean, that hit home for so many of those Mm -hmm. older wrestlers. I mean, that's, that's really how it is. They really hit the nail on the head. I remember the first time Oh, for the wrestler? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and it was, there's so many things about it. You're like, this is so great, and you're, you're happy and you're sad. There's so many, so much emotion in that movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of my, I mean, if I wasn't a wrestling fan, I would have thought that movie was one of the best movies I've I've seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I agree 100%, so. Yeah, it's one of my favorite movies. It reminds me of the documentary Beyond the Mat, mm-hmm. but, like, <laughs> but like the live action version. Of oh, I'm such a I'm such a huge fan of that of that movie. I still own my VHS copy of that. I own two or I own four VHS movies still to this day. One of them is Beyond the Mat. The other three are the original Star Wars. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> we brought the right guy on, didn't we? So. In any of these, I mean, do you see is most of the ones that you put on here? Because like the one, the first the first thing I think of is like number one, if they're like we're gonna do a movie of a wrestler. Obviously, for me, Paige is not the first person I fucking think of. No, no, no. Granted, no. now that I understand more of her backstory, mm-hmm. I'm more intrigued. Exactly, you have but, to know her backstory, right? And that's I think that's why the rock kind of stepped in he's like people need to hear this story this mm-hmm. is an insane story and i'm glad they're making it more of a comedy too well that's and that's what i was gonna say is do you see any of the ones that like you put on your list is more of the biopic style or do you see any that could potentially flip to more of that dramedy uh i don't know as many people's uh, as many wrestler stories you know the only other one and i this may even just be an unfair comparison because I'm really interested to see Zelina Vega play uh, play AJ Lee in the mm-hmm. movie. That is one thing that I'm kind of interested to see because I like I, I like her as a professional wrestler, and I was a huge fan of AJ Lee when she was a professional wrestler. And I actually read AJ Lee's book, and she's got a very her book is very dramedy, uh, which she she suffers from bipolar and mm-hmm. she, but she has a very funny sense of humor about it like she really she'll talk about how she'll joke about how she goes from being happy and elated while watching tv and then she sees uh, sarah mclaughlin on the puppy commercial and she'll cry for three days you know, <laughs> you know? who doesn't cry for three days well, <laughs> but that, that she but she has a sense of humor about about her her suffering in that and she She's gone through some real shit too. I think that was uh, that was the one thing I knew that she had gone through some real shit. You know, between going homeless with her whole family and then uh, having to drop out of college due to her bipolar things like that. I mean, she could. I think that would be another one that could really dip into the dramedy, and that would be just because of who she is mm-hmm. and you know her taking the taking light of her of her situation while. Now she's very involved with Nami and things like that. So she, I mean, she has, she's taken a very lighthearted side to something that is very, very serious and near and dear to her heart. So, and that could be maybe one of those movies. Maybe we get a spinoff of Fighting with My Family. Maybe, 
Who knows? No, yeah. It, it could be interesting. I just, I just, I, I legit honestly hope it does well. Just because this is the unconventional WWE film. And I, you know, I think it looks good. And I think it looks like it's done very well. The, the, the casting choices in it just blow my mind. The guy who's writing and directing it just, it's just overall, I'm just flabbergasted. And I, just, I, I legit hope that it does well, that um, it finds the right audience because most of the draw probably will be Dwayne Johnson. Mm-hmm. There no, will no be doubt about that. Granted, I'm sitting here going, I want to see fucking Nick Frost, you know, verbally going up against the rock because that shit looks funny as hell. <laughs> That's um, the dude from Shaun of the Dead. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The one plays his dad. Yeah, yeah. Or plays her dad. <laughs> when I saw that he was playing uh, uh, Soraya's husband or uh, Paige's dad, I'm like, okay, I might have to go see this yes. movie now. <laughs> so. so, all right, we're going to continue. Yes. yes. So what's another person you have on uh, list? You know, I had Eddie Guerrero on my list. I thought he, he had a really, he'd be another one kind of like the wrestler. Like, but he taken far too soon Mm -hmm. Uh, he he died i think he was 38 when he died but he he did he died clean and sober uh the way that he had always wanted to Mm -hmm. and that was something that he really struggled for and this guy i mean he should have died a million times too he there there's a very common theme to some of the more miraculous stories and that a lot of these guys should have died i also had jake roberts on my list um, Matt and Jeff Hardy was another one. I think they've had a very, a very, very hard run of it. Um, but the other one that I think that I think would be an amazing just underdog story was I would love to see the Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson story, uh, who now he's killing it and he's still got this amazing career, but mm-hmm. you know, the fact that he, 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 he didn't think he was going to be wrestling ever again. Exactly. He didn't think he was going to be wrestling ever again. On top of that, he had wrestled for like 15 years on the indies and WWE wasn't even looking at him. And then suddenly he's within WWE. Then he gets fired from WWE and they bring him back uh, because the fans were outraged that they fired him. <laughs> so, I mean, he's got the, he's got a really cool story. And on top of that, I mean, he's, he gets to WWE and he's dating a Bella. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy, he's a great underdog story for him. I, he was one of the other ones. Uh, I did put Roman Reigns on my list. I think a lot, I'm going to get booed really hard. I can already hear WWE fans booing at that one. Right, uh, right exactly. <laughs> and you know what I think? Fuck them. See, because I'm... especially after finding out about the whole cancer thing. And it's the second yeah. time that he's had cancer. Yes. And, and I found out about that. I found out that he had cancer when in his early 20s. Oh, God. When was October? Uh, it was, yeah, back in October. I did a seminar with Tommy Dreamer. And Tommy, he's kind of talking, he's like, you know, make sure when you're out there, you're telling your story. Tommy Dreamer's amazing. Mm -hmm. He's out there telling us, like, hey, make sure you're telling your story when you're out there. Make sure people are are connecting with you personally. Because here's the deal. Roman Reigns beat cancer. WWE's not even talking about it. I was like, what? (laughs) Why are people booing this guy? And then he said the same thing. Zack Ryder, another one who beat cancer as a child. He beat mm-hmm. cancer, and now he he's been wrestling for the WWE for twelve years. So I and I hope that they don't that I, that's pretty public knowledge. I wouldn't. I hope that they don't think that I'm trying to get them over or anything <laughs> like that. But I, I think that would be a great story to see. Um, then my I had Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. I think would be a good professional wrestling story as well. You had to go uh, all New Japan on this. I you? did. I, so for people who don't know who those, t- I mean, of all the names on the list. Those are definitely the ones people are not going to know. Yeah. For what, you know, people listening to ours. For like, if it weren't for the fact that I, 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 you know, basically have lived with wrestling fans or no wrestling fans. Like, I would know, have no effing clue what New Japan is. Oh, yeah. Well, because New Japan is, New Japan has been the WWE of Japan for, I mean, since before WWE was around, since yeah. the mid-70s. I mean, there's an amazing, there, uh, I. Shouldn't they change the name by now, then? They're not the New Japan. <laughs> They're not New Japan anymore. Well, and then there was in Japan. There's New Japan. There's All Japan. There's Noah. There's DDT Pro. Which, if you ever want a good laugh, look up DDT Pro. One of that's where that's where the Joey Ryan Dick Flip video came from, and everything like that. So hardcore wrestling fans are going to know what that is. Um, but yeah, Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, um, 
really cool story, and these guys are still going. Uh, they're uh, when they started, you know, WWE uh, did not want to give them a shot. They thought they were disrespectful. Thought they were nothing but spot monkeys, and. Three weeks ago, they announced, or I'm sorry, at New Year's, they announced they're starting their own company. Mm-hmm. And not only are they starting their own company, but their first show is sold out uh, at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Four minutes. Yeah, in four minutes. And this, the reason, like, especially for the Young Bucks, uh, for those who don't know, I heard, I read this interview. Matt Jackson, one of the Young Bucks, uh, he was contemplating quitting wrestling at one time, and he was in an airport and he was trying to buy a dollar chicken sandwich from a Chick-fil-A and his card got declined. You know, you fast forward to 2019 and he's sold out the MGM brand in four minutes. That's an amazing underdog story. to me. I think the, I think the, 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 the connection putting them in basically Cody giving the WWE the finger yeah, and saying, you know what, I'm doing this my way. Mm -hmm. And, I, I legit think Cody and them are going to give Vince a run for his money. Oh, yeah. This is, like, right now, 2019. I thought 2018 was this amazing year for to be involved with professional wrestling because there was uh, – I've had to turn down shows just due to, you know, having to actually make money sometimes. and But, I, I mean, if I really, if I really, really, really hustled at it, there is a chance that even a guy like me could – probably find a show every weekend if not Mm -hmm. more on that um and i think that's true for any professional wrestler for a guy like me you know i've got a family and everything like that that i have to take care of uh outside of that so i can't do that the way that some of these guys are but there are some really hungry guys that you don't have to go far (laughs) and there's going to be a show for you to work and that's it's such a such a cool time to be involved with professional wrestling because especially on the independent scene because we can do on the independent scene we can do things without having somebody in our ear which is a, a really fun situation to be in you know there are obviously bookers and uh, other wrestlers that I have to have to please and there, you know there are certain ways they want me to say certain things mm-hmm. that, you know, when I do it and I, I'm happy to oblige uh, but for AEW, this All Elite Wrestling to be coming out, and for the backing that they have with the the co-owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, you know this is there there are there's some real money being thrown at these guys uh, for the first time. Whereas before, there was only one place these guys could go. Yep. And this is this is amazing. I'm really happy. I got to meet uh, one of the guys that they signed at AEW was uh, MJF, and. If you want to just, if you want to have a good laugh at the perfect asshole, MJF is the perfect asshole. That could be a thing. I don't know, that uh, maybe they pull a, a WWE thing with with that and you know team up with some production company and that's where you get your Young Bucks movie, a Cody movie. Yeah, yeah, you really could that's, see that. that. I don't know. That's something they could look. You know, they're throwing a lot of oh, money give, at this I, type I, of shit. I legit, so. honestly, say is give them time. Yeah. Just because I mean they're they're not half assing it. They're not. And they they're they're putting passion forward in that they know what they want and they're going for it. And I legit think that if Vince doesn't pay attention, he is going to get crushed. I think he's already pretty emotionally crushed. You can see well, right. there well, are the... things like, you know, you hear these reports of uh of the revival uh, are threatening to leave, and then two weeks later they've got the tag team titles. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, well, just tonight the Usos was the rumor uh, that they were leaving. They, they were they're trying to leave with Naomi. No, what then? They, they won the title. They did. Okay, yeah. Yep. I haven't even watched the show yet, so spoilers. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> and, Damn it! But they, yeah. But it's awesome. I mean, from for, from our point of point of view, I mean, if you're if you're a guy who works backstage, I mean, obviously you're a fan, and obviously you have opinions, and obviously I have opinions too. And I, I guess I'm also of the of the the mindset that I have no intentions of of, of 
really getting my hopes up that WWE is ever going to call me. So right. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you know, if I ever make it doing this and I make a living doing this, I'll be extremely blessed and I'm very excited to do that. But being the local, the local ring announcer has always been a, a, a super high point for me. So, <laughs> well, when you start making the big bank, just remember the little guys. Oh, I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> Here's a spoiler. Yeah. Vince listens to our show every oh, does week. He? So now you're really screwed. <laughs> What the fuck is a podcast? <laughs> he wouldn't even know how to hit play. <laughs> okay, so, because you've pretty much alluded to pretty much everybody on this list with... Um, one left. One left, which is this actually... This is the big one. This for me... <laughs> Literally. Pun, pun <laughs> intended. Pun intended. Yes, oh, yeah, Is Andre the Giant. Yeah, Andre, yeah. Well, I... I, I personally... Th- when we even started talking about this, that was the first guy that came to my mind. Okay. But I think partly that is because, like, before I started to get back into watching the wrestling um, and everything like that was, like, when I was a kid, it was Hulk Hogan, Rock, uh, you know, Randy Savage. It was Andre the Giant. It was the, uh, um, oh, fuck. Ultimate like, Warrior. Well, no, I'm I'm talking even like Animal and the Swashbucklers and like oh, way, uh, way back, do. way back then. Yeah, yeah. So like when, because I, I think you know, like you you look at like how hard and and course he sort of was for WWE, but then or WWF back then, but then you see the little softer side. Like I think for like Princess Bride. Oh yeah, yeah. and I just I'm, I was fascinated. But the only problem I have with it is because of. The being that he was, I don't think it's a makeable. Like you legit couldn't make the movie, not because you couldn't want to, but you would not be able to find anybody to be able to play him. Oh yeah, no, he was he was a larger than life character, both on the personal personal side of things and on the professional side yeah. of things. Like when he was, and I, this was before I was ever a wrestling fan, so I can't speak about it. But watching those old clips back of when he when he turned heel on Hogan, I mean that was. That was heartbreaking for mm-hmm. the people who were watching live because Andre, Andre and Hulk, I mean, they were right up there. They wanted to see, oh, you know, who's the better man? And then Andre turns on the fans and he, he pairs up with Bobby Heaton, Heenan. You know, those are, I mean, that's what wrestling is supposed to do when it's good is it's supposed to toy with your emotions and it's storytelling and all of that. But it's, you know, Andre himself, as, as far as a personality, you're right. Nobody, I don't think anybody could match that. No. I mean, so. you want to talk about a man who literally probably had the biggest heart. Oh, yeah, yeah. And his docu, I mean, I think the documentary did him justice. I think that's why I put him at, it kind of, in my top ten, I put him at number ten. Yeah, uh, just because I think his story's been told. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't think they could do him any more justice. And I don't think that they need to saturate his uh, his legacy is more than they already have. So yeah, that documentary is great. Have you ever watched it? Mm-hmm. Right? No. Yeah, it's on it's on Hulu. Good to know. So it was an HBO documentary. Mm-hmm. It's really good. Mm-hmm. You would love it. Yeah, it's and, a tearjerker. It is. So. It is. And he does. He has a fascinating story. And the problem is, yeah, you can't cast anyone as Andre the Giant. There's no. there's nobody. I mean, I mean, even if you could find somebody of his stature, somebody of his physique. To try to find somebody to be able that to be able to capture and master, and then the be a heart. good actor, yes, yeah, to play yeah. that ca- yeah. that character like that. Yeah. No, well, and then you you hear all these stories about him on on cast or uh, I'm sorry, not on cast when he was on the cast of Princess Bride and how he was so uplifting with everybody. Yeah. And you know, you see those pictures of I love the pictures of uh, him on the set of Conan the Barbarian, and you see him with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's a massive human being, mm-hmm. and he's got, and he's just uh, yeah, dwarf. Yeah, no, and he's doing pull-ups on Andre's arms. <laughs> I mean, that's like that's who Andre was. He loved being the friendly giant, and mm-hmm. that that's an amazing legacy that he's left behind. So, so I had a few to throw out here too. Yes, I want to see what what your reaction is. Okay. Because we did, we had a lot of the same ones. I had Ric Flair, mm-hmm. Eddie Guerrero, Jake Roberts, Andre. Yep. But my number one, and always will be my number one, until they actually make this. It'll never happen. I'm yeah. bursting your bubble now. Do you know which one I'm throwing out? Yeah, you want Vince fucking Vincent McMahon. Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Needs his own I heard that movie. they were going to make a Vince McMahon movie, and then somebody... Vince was all for it and had read the script and gave it the go-ahead, and then somebody read the... I heard that somebody read the script... And there are a few scenes in there that are like, how that's not even close to even being believable. <laughs> like somehow, like he, I think the 
scene that I heard about was that he he discovered Andre the Giant in Paris because he was his waiter and, and shit like that, like which isn't the <laughs> I'm truth. Trying to, I mean, I'm trying to picture Andre the Giant as a waiter, right. and like trying to make it, getting through like a very busy like you know can, you know I picture like Paris, everything's like scrunched up, you know, and just. You know, it's fucking bull in a china shop. <laughs> Imagine how many plates Andre could hold at a time, though. <laughs> One on each finger. Yeah. <laughs> he just hands out. Right. Well, I think that's the point right there. Vince would f- fucking love a movie about himself. Well, of course he would. And it, even more exaggerated version, like alternate reality type of stuff, I think he would be all for that type of shit. Yeah, I, I just... <laughs> I, I don't think that... I guess for a character, a character does have to be relatable. And Vince McMahon, to me, like, even if I ever meet him, I, I can't imagine me ever having any kind of relatability to Vince McMahon. Because he's a multi-billionaire and has been for a very long time. And uh, don't get me wrong, he's done amazing things. And, but, and taking some awesome chances. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the only... <laughs> we basically... <laughs> If you were going to put uh, his story into a musical, it was basically Greatest Showman. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, like, that's, I mean, and I, I don't mean that lightly, is that, you know, Vince McMahon is very well known that he loves the, the circus mentality mm-hmm. when he puts together a show. He likes it. That's why he hired Andre the Giant. He, was, he wanted that off actor just when you walk in, you know, that's, which is a smart way of marketing. Um, but I just, I don't think that a Vince McMahon movie is ever going to happen. <laughs> so I can always wish. Yeah. I would want the straight up like anti hero type of story, like like a Patrick Bateman or uh, uh, Jordan Belfort and Wolf of Wall Street type <laughs> of character. That's how you'd have to do Vince. Uh, another one to throw out there, since we did talk about Beyond the Mat, either Mick Foley or Terry Funk. I could see. I I would like to see Terry Funk's um, Mick. Mick is. Uh, is my favorite professional wrestler of all Mick time. is a good dude. Yeah. Um, I think that's why I wouldn't want to see the movie, though. It's because <laughs> the, the hardest things that... Uh, if you couldn't put the hardship uh, of his outside of being an underdog mm-hmm. on that, and he really he captured that very well in his books. Uh, and I don't think you could top the books, uh, which I, I'd still go see it. Don't get me wrong. And I think it would be... Some, I mean, that'd be that'd be another wrestler that Jack that Jack Black could play. I, oh, I could, I, that I could see. Yeah. I was just gonna say that, yeah. like Jack Black could play Mick Foley totally. Yeah, uh, you know, and Mick, I think he's he's always just been, you know, a, a big heart in mm-hmm. professional wrestling. I think he was really, especially in the late '90s. I mean, he was the underdog. Uh, but, he was the one that was willing to go the extra mile to the point where he literally would be on the verge of killing himself to do oh, it. Oh, right, right. Well, and I, I mean, I remember reading his book, and Arne Anderson walked up, and he goes, how old are you? And this is when he had first started, and he gave him his age. He, at the time, he was in his early 20s. He goes, you keep wrestling the way you are. You're not going to be walking when you're 30. And you know, he was very close to not walking in his 40s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had hip, I think he just recently had his hips repaired. And he had to lose like 80 pounds just to be able to be mobile again. You know, it's just, so, and, you know, maybe, you know, actually, now the more I talk about it, yeah, that might actually be a good start. That would be another one that might be a good dramedy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I And I could see that. I could see Mick Foley's being more... Uh, if they did it right, could it could either be a serious biopic or or they could actually probably spin it the other way because um, having seen him live and h- having him tell his story, mm-hmm. um, the dude is absolutely fascinating. And I just think that he, that would be one of those ones that would take somebody by surprise, kind of like fighting with my family. Like if they have no idea, they all they know is for what they've seen on TV. Yeah. And you really start to peel back those layers and you just sit there and just... And, awe of what you have in front of you yeah well and i've seen him twice i saw his his uh spoken to her twice yeah i saw the most recent one where he did uh down in, he came down to omaha and he did the 20 years after the hell on the cell match mm. and talked about you know living that moment again and that's the one thing that i think i'm i would be most afraid of if they did make a Mick Foley movie is that he tells his own story so well well that's why i would think that if if it would literally be have to be a written by him. It would, yeah. I mean, they would. would they would have to have somebody come in to help co-write just for the sake of he's never written a screenplay. Right. But I legit think they would have to be a written by. Nobody else. Yeah. The yeah. Only, 
you're a hundred percent correct. On that, that was yeah. my caveat for this. Is that he, he needs to be to. on to co-write and then produce? He yes, like be there constantly. Yeah, yes. sure you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. Yes. And he's an he's an awesome awesome writer. I uh, I read. I read his first uh, three books. Book three it was not my favorite, but it, again, but it was written very well, mm-hmm. and uh, I'll never take that away from him at all. Um, and then when he was given a little bit more uh, more reign when he was with Impact Wrestling, and he wrote uh, Countdown to Lockdown. That was again. I mean, it was uh, one of I thought it was a, an underdog book. It was uh, fantastic, but yes, he does need to be the writer on that. If yes. He's writing his own story. All right, I got two more to throw at you. Yes, the Hart family. So we're again going to go off the the documentary that Wrestling was, with Shadows. Yes, is that, that what it was? Yes, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yep. So kind of stealing the the idea from the page thing was starting with the documentary, mm-hmm. kind of how biofics usually work. Start a documentary first, then the f- feature film. Mm-hmm. So I think the Bret Hart story, or even you could just go to Stu Hart and tell that story. I think it'd be super interesting. I, I don't think you have the either one without the other though. You have to tell a whole Hart family story if you do it. Um, there's been a lot. Of, a lot of unfortunate situations that can be put into that movie. Um, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time, like you don't have the full heart legacy without every single one of them. You know, Brett was the biggest part of that, but you've got, you've got Stu, you've got, uh, you've got Owen, you've got Davy boy, you've got Jim, you throw in all the guys who came into the heart dungeon. You got, you know, you've got the beginnings of Jericho's story. You've got Lance storm who went in through there. Uh, and then additionally, I mean, Stu just being, you know, Stu Hart and the things that you hear about him, it, uh, you know, where he would literally wrestle bears <laughs> in his backyard. I mean, just the, like this was the toughest human being you'll ever meet in your life. You know, but that could be a good one. Um, they're Canadian, aren't they? They are. <laughs> they are definitely they Canadian. Are definitely <laughs> well, you're Canadian. Like, I was like, I'm pretty sure they're Canadian. He wrestled bears. They're fucking Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Stereotypes are wrong, Brian. <laughs> They no, that would be a good one. Um, I really, I, I, I would love to see that. I know that uh, Owen's wife has been kind of helping to hold Owen's Hall of Fame induction get held back. Uh, there are certain things that she wants from WWE, and which I think she's, uh, I mean, legit, one hundred percent in the right yeah. Yeah. for that. I, if I'm speaking freely on that, you know, the, I think her wanting something for having lost her husband is completely valid. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would, I would think that the same thing would happen if they decided to write a movie. So yeah. And, and having somebody play Owen as the comedy relief. I mean, I'm <laughs> throwing this one out there. I would love to see someone like Zach Efron play Owen Hart because he, he is oh a great God, comedic I, actor. I can see that. Yes. Oh. So you're right. <laughs> I was like bleach his hair blonde. Yep. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, that's why. I, I, if anything, I would want this not to be anything WWE related. Right. Yeah. You're straight up. You focus on the family, and mm-hmm. yeah. it's gonna be a little tricky though with the, this much connection that the the entire family has, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. But you could focus more on that. I, I think the Stu Hart story would be fascinating, even well, more than Brett or any other. Oh other yeah. Sons. Yeah. I think the Stu Hart story would be really cool. Just the, even the little idiosyncrasies that he would throw into if you're telling a Bret Hart story. I mean, I mean, Dad talking in your ear the whole time mm-hmm. during a match, and him showing up ringside at every pay per view. I mean, that's a that's a huge huge part of the Bret Hart legacy in the first place. So, yeah, I think that would be a, a cool story to see. I got one last one to throw out at you here. The Legion of Doom, Road Warrior Hawk, and Road Warrior Animal. I don't know enough about their story outside of, you know, Hawk and his demons um, to say one way or the other on that. I got to meet, uh, I didn't really get to meet him because uh, I went down to StarCast last year uh, as a fan and got to walk by Road Warrior Animal and, like, that was one of those situations like, holy shit, that's a warrior animal. And like, you know, there were just some, some wrestlers when I was a kid that were just larger than life. But you're, you're right. The Hawk and animal, that would be a fun story to watch, especially I would love anybody, anybody to tell me any part of Paul Ellering's story. That would be, <laughs> and, and, oh, yeah, I mean, everybody talks so highly about him and I want to know. So he's such an enigma to me that I would love to see that. So, yeah, that would. Yeah. That's the two guys that my dad grew up with, the Road Warriors. And then when I got into wrestling, it was more like uh, early two thousands. So, and then he finally showed me you know, this older stuff with the oh, Road yeah. Warriors. Oh, and yeah, I was like, yeah. God, this is amazing. And I had, I remember, I had this three disc set, and the 
one of the sets had, had the documentary in it. I would watch that over and over. Mm-hmm. And I'm 10 years old watching a documentary. And like, but it was fascinating. <laughs> <Nerd>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> WWE, I will say this for WWE. They put out, they, some of their documentaries that they put out in the 2000s were must-see documentaries. Oh, yeah. I mean, they are very underrated from any perspective. I mean, they, they tell a great story, even if the story's not that interesting in the first place. I mean... Some of these people led a very charmed life to get to the point the, of where they were, and they still somehow made their stories sound interesting. Um, the other person that I had on my list, and I can't believe, I don't know if I did complete him on my list, was Scott Hall, who, uh, if you haven't watched his documentary, that he's got a really crazy story. Uh, and I would really recommend that one if anybody hasn't, hasn't seen that one. That one's a great one. Um, I will, <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, put myself out on blast with this one here, but the one story that everybody's going to tweet at you and Facebook you out that they want to see, because it's been rumored as a movie for years now, that I am absolutely 100% against is seeing the Chris Benoit movie. I am 100% anti them telling that story anymore. I don't care where he, and, and anybody who's listening to this, they can put me on blast all they want with it. I, you know, um, given his the situation that was going through with that, mm-hmm. nobody who is in that in that locker room needs to relive his life. And I am one hundred percent against the everybody who I I see some of the guys that I know that they they'll be all you know pro LGBT and you know pro everything, and then at the same time be like, oh, why won't WWE induct? Chris Benoit, well, he fucking murdered his family, okay? And whether you like that or not, uh, liked him as a wrestler or not is irrelevant on that. Okay, he had brain damage, yes, and a lot of the stuff maybe he didn't realize was going on. And I will give him the benefit of the doubt on that, but it doesn't change the fact that it fucking happened. And that story doesn't need to be told. Anybody who was backstage who knew him does not need to relive that, okay? It was completely haunting as a fan, it, and if you knew him personally, that had to have been one of the most haunting things you've ever had to live through. That movie was in production a long time. Yeah. Like, I think uh, Lee was, Schreiber was, was yeah, cast, yeah, that's actually who it was. cast as, as, Benoit. as Benoit. Yeah. But See, I didn't movie, even realize it was even supposed to be a thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They had a writer and a director, and Lee Schreiber was cast. And then something must have happened between either WWE and the production studio. Who, I don't know what the, the story is there. But yeah, this movie's not going to happen. I don't, and for me, I don't want this to ever happen. And I'm, I don't I'm, either. No, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I was probably, when did that happen? Oh, seven. I was 12, 13 years old, and I, w- I couldn't watch wrestling anymore. I My was, parents wouldn't allow me. I was 18. Um, I was actually working at a camp as a camp counselor when it happened. I remember it happened during the summer. And, you know, this is before the age of smartphone. We had, all had something in our pockets, as mine buzzes as I say that. Um, but I, I remember I had my phone off all week because I was with my, my cabin of kids. And I went and turned my phone back on. And I had text message and voicemail from one of my buddies. And he was like, hey, you got to call me. This is, you know, this is just a crazy situation. Yeah, okay, okay. I... Uh, so I call him and he goes, "Yeah, did you did you hear that Chris Benoit died?" And because our camp ran from Sunday to Friday, so they find out that Chris Benoit isn't going to be at the pay per view on Sunday. Mm-hmm. They find out he died on Monday and do a big dedication show for him on Monday. They find out what really happens on Tuesday, mm-hmm. and so I missed all of that. And so I call I call him and I was like, "Chris Benoit died," you know. It, like, oh man, that's so sad. And he goes, no, 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 no. You gotta, you gotta jump online. You gotta see what's going on. And I was like, okay. And I, I like, I, so I go and I watch it in order. I go home to do my laundry. I order the pay-per-view and knowing that it was supposed to be CM Punk versus Chris Benoit. And I watch it and I'm like, oh, you know, that's, that's John Morrison. Okay. Something happened, whatever. Watch Raw and it's the dedication yep. show because I had DVR'd it. And then the next, it, the next morning, as I was getting ready to leave, I go to watch ECW, and that's when they announced. Uh, that's when they announced what happened with Benoit. You know, you know, given the circumstances, you know, this will be dedicated to the healing and 
I was like, what? And so I read, I'm like, no, none of this has... And then I went to a gas station, and every single one of the magazines that was at the gas station was covering that story. And it's just such an unfortunate circumstance. Mm-hmm. So that was... Uh, yeah, you're right. I don't want to see that ever happen. I think we've... It's been played out enough by some of the fans who are really, really... They're, you know, oh, you got to respect those who came before. And we don't have to respect yeah. this situation. We have to respect the people who are really really need to heal from this situation Mm -hmm. so yeah i think maybe just thinking the way hollywood works i think this movie eventually will happen years from now um, because that just that story you were telling it was a huge media circus during that time because i actually remember what happened for me because i was it was june 24th i think is when it happened and my birthday's the 25th so i was just going to turn 13 years old got it and yeah i was watching monday night raw Every single week, wouldn't let my parents mm-hmm. leave the house on Monday mm-hmm. nights because I had to watch Raw. Right. <laughs> and so we were watching it, and they're trying to explain to me, you know, what happened with him and during his the dedication show. Mm-hmm. And then when the news hit of what actually happened, they mm-hmm. had to try to tell thirteen year old me what what's going on. And we're sitting yeah. watching CNN and Nancy uh, Nancy Grace. Oh, Nancy night. Grace just yeah, she had a heyday with yeah. that whole situation. And I think that's. Just thinking of how a movie could go, that might be where your movie goes. The whole aftermath type of thing. Yeah. Well, and... Unfortunately. You know, and I got to give, you know, kudos to one of the... Who's a guy who is local now. Um, Mr. Kennedy handled a lot of the media at that time. Uh, him and him and Cena. And Kennedy would go on... He went on Nancy Grace and defended professional wrestling. Like, for that, he, he does not get enough thanks. Uh, and I, I, I've met... I've met Ken a few times at this point because he's right next door to us. He lives right in Minneapolis, has a school there. Don't mean to put him over, but that's where his school is. But yeah, that's he he went on Nancy Grace and he he try he defended everything that we do, and that's that doesn't get remembered enough. That he was one of the very few people who was like, no, 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 no. This was. This was an isolated incident. Like we, you can't compare all of us to this. Mm-hmm. So, that was one of the one of the things that I do remember about that. And, you know, and I remember CNN doing another documentary about that. And at the time, you know, that's when that's when Punk got the the world title right away. Yeah, you know, uh, that was a big reason too. I would imagine, or the thought behind it, because Punk was the drug free guy, and that was his whole shtick. He was straight edge. Uh, and I would imagine that's why they gave him the title at the time is that we need to have a guy who doesn't do drugs and it, like is very known for that. Like how how good would that look on CNN? So mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it's a, it's an unfortunate story and Hollywood does like their tragedy stories, so that unfortunately might be, be happening. So yeah, unfortunately, I think I think it'll this will be like be, if that ever ha- comes to fruition, that's going to be after like we're long dead because the people, the family yeah. will have to be dead. Somebody will have to figure out how they bought the rights. WWE will have to let it be made. Yeah. You know. So before we go any more dark and depressing than we just did for the last <laughs> fifteen minutes, I'm just going to go into my corner and cry. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was an excellent conversation. Yeah. So many great movies that could, could happen. Can't wait to go see Fighting with My Family, guys. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if you could only pick one. If it's so, now that we've gotten so dark, it's like, oh, good, it's a dramedy. Thank God. Yeah, right? right. Oh. This is why we need it, actually. So if you could only pick one out of your top ten, what's is it Ric Flair? It's Flair. Right. It's Flair. That's yeah. All day, all day and night. Yeah, that's – he <laughs> – you, if you haven't watched that thirty for thirty, you need to go see that thirty for or that thirty for thirty. Only if we get the Ric Flair rap song to go along for the credits, it probably would Flair happen. Drip. The Ric yep. Flair drip, yes. Yep. yep. You know, at first when I heard that thing, I'm like, "What on earth?" And then I saw not only <laughs> does he endorse it, he was in the music video. Oh my! And God. I'm like, "All right, nope, nope." I don't even care how bad this song is. I'm sold. As it was happening, I was like, this is the most Ric Flair thing that has ever Ric Flared. <laughs> like, <laughs> which is exactly how I felt about Glass. Like, this is the most M. Night Shyamalan movie I have ever watched in my life. <laughs> All right. so we do... I think we need Charlie on more often. Yeah. <laughs> so we he do just get... went M. Night on us. <laughs> Pulled a twist. What? My, that's exactly what happened while we were in the theater. Me and my buddy went and watched it, and he we watched it on a Monday morning, like ten thirty in the morning, and we were one of six people in it. And as everything was going on, he would stand up and yell, "What a twist!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Oh. One way to make glass more entertaining, that's for sure. <laughs> it was, like I said, it was the most M. Night Shyamalan movie you will ever see. So as we were talking about dark and depressing movies, we have How to Train Your Dragon 3 coming out. <laughs> well, you need the little lighthearted family animated movie. I think we need that right now. We, we, we need the palate cleanser now. Yep, so finally finishing off the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy. Um, I've never watched these movies. I've heard nothing but good things. So, I don't, know. I don't know. Well, you, you know, you figure um, only bits and pieces of yeah. like the first one, and you figure it's just Jay Borchel is just like, oh, you want to make another one? You're going to pay me? Bring it on. I watched an interview recently with him, and yeah, that's pretty much. He's like, yeah, he's like, people give me a lot of credit for these movies. I'm like, I show up for two weeks every two years. <laughs> I'm like, the people who animate it, give them the credit. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. And you, how many people, like, you know, oh, this person's the voice, this person's the voice. It's like, yeah, you're right. They literally sit in a booth for two weeks, three weeks, depending on how much work they need to do. Like, I remember them talking about, Toy. I think it was Toy Story 3. They were talking like Tim Allen, I think is what it was. And he's like, uh, they're asking about the story. They're doing the junket and everything like that before the movie came out. He's like, dude, I recorded that shit like two years ago. I don't remember what the hell I said. I have to wait. When, I'm going to be watching a whole brand new movie when you guys watch it. <laughs> So we do also get fighting with my family finally. Finally, yes. I'm I'm excited for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was I was afraid we were. That's why I've been like stalking the Cinemark site because of how wrong you've been like three times now. I do have one of the wrestlers for Midwest All Pro is also a manager at the East Side Movie Theater in Sioux Falls. They are getting it on the 22nd. He did confirm that with me verbally. Yes. Oh. So. Oh. I I flat out like every like every like two days I would go on Cinemark and I'd refresh it and whatnot. <laughs> and finally, when it showed that it was available for the 21st, I immediately took a picture and I sent it to yeah. Casey. I'm yeah. like, they are well because like um it was Welcome to Marwin, and then there was another one that we thought we weren't getting that showed up. And we, we didn't talk about it or anything like that on here or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, before we even got this thing posted, I'm like, shit, we are getting that movie. <laughs> Those are the two wide release movies coming up. Uh, we also have a couple local things. Cinema Falls is bringing Women at War March 10th. And Full Circle Book, Book Co-op and Indie Events is bringing Lords of Chaos February 24th. So check out their fa Facebook pages for more information on those. Uh, we also have another... Local event coming to the Cinemark Theater from Fathom Events. Classic film right here. My Fair Lady. Your Fair Lady. No, your Fair Lady. I'm not My Fair Lady. Yeah. Uh, so if you're into classic films, February 20th, they're doing a special uh, anniversary screening of My Fair Lady. That Women of War, we di I did see the trailer for that, for the Cinema Falls event. And that actually, it it looks very interesting. If, it, if you haven't watched that trailer, I would maybe recommend that. I can't, Cinema Falls is a cool company too. I, I would definitely like to give them a good shout out here because I really enjoy some of the things that they do with like the documentary shorts and things like that, that they've done recently. So yeah, I'm really into that. So, and then we go from that to, uh, uh, a cult can go on all death metal on us. Yeah. Death metal horror <laughs> film and Lords of chaos. Yes. So you get all types of indie flair. Yeah. Who falls South Dakota. But yeah, that's the show. That is the show. We got to plug some of our friends. We got to you, plug. Uh, you know what I think first? I think Charlie needs to do his own plug. Do my own plug? Yes. <laughs> pl plug yourself. Where the hell can people find you? Oh, uh, people can find me. You can, for the most part, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram for my wrestling stuff. I am at Wrestling Voice One, and that's Wrestling Voice Numeral One. And then, if you are interested, if you are a booker, if you are a a wrestling booker, or if you are looking for a professional wrestling announcer for ring announcing or commentary backstage stuff, if you're recording, you can for any serious inquiries. If you email me at Wrestling Voice Charlie at gmail dot com. That's Wrestling Voice C H A R L I E at gmail dot com. He has his shit down better than we do. That's for sure. <laughs> I get. <laughs> He's got more practice. I get. I get paid twenty bucks a weekend to do this, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm gonna give out a shout out to our buddies. We got our buddy Andy over at Fat Dude Digs Flicks. And hey, look at I got it right this time. You got it right. I got it right this time. And Jameson and Blake with the Midwest Movie Talk. You can check them out on Facebook. Um, uh, and he's got his thing on Twitter going on there, too. Um, Jameson's got his SD film thoughts on Twitter. Um, really good dudes. They, they, they like to talk their movies, too. They like their movie stuff. Yeah. I think we will be the collective. 
the film collective. We will be the collective. Yeah. We're all part of the Sioux Falls Film Collective, but you know what? Where else you can find us? You can find us on Facebook, Sioux Falls Film Community. Uh, also, check out our website where you can uh, check out Brian's review for Alita Battle Angel, uh, my review for Happy Death Day to You, and I'm also going to be doing a wrestling article coming up, so we'll uh, oh, yeah. look forward to that. What, uh, what, are you, what are you covering? We're going to do top ten wrestlers' appearances in film. Okay. Yeah. Mainly because I screwed up the, uh, your homework and he ended up having to change his article. <laughs> hey, I think this is just as fun. Appearances in film, okay. I mean, I think Again. Ready to Rumble is just going to be number one no matter what. So. <laughs> you also, just, well, you if you're just, a fan of David Arquette. I uh, love just, uh, Ready to Rumble. Oh, you oh, love that movie. I you like it. way, like way, way too much, much love that movie. Uh, also, check out our website. Uh, on there we have our Tee Public store. You can find some t-shirts, mugs, stickers, all that cool stuff. Also, check out our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play. As and well YouTube. As YouTube. Yes. In YouTube. The YouTubes. The YouTubes. Also, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram. God. Look at that. You're actually starting to get down the first couple it. of times. Fuck that shit up. I did. I <laughs> fucked it up hard. So. That's not too bad, though. You were screwing up the, those plugs, and I couldn't get Andy's shit correct. Yeah. At least I could sort of get ours now. <laughs> <laughs> well, until next time. I'm Casey. I'm Brian. And thanks again, Charlie, for being on. Bye-bye now.